So I had the opportunity to um, sit in Professor Cooper's class. And, um, you know, before I started to get A's, I did go through a period where when I started out, Professor Cooper asked me if I was seasick. <laughs> I said, what you mean? Well, see at the stars. <laughs> but eventually, after a talk from her, things improved. I was able to leave you with an upper second class honor. So thank you, Professor Cooper, for that little talk that you gave me. But we thank you so much for your work, your contribution, not just to the University of the West Indies, but to Jamaica and to mankind. So we say that she's royal. You agree? You know the song from Taurus Riley? Can you sing along with us? One, two, three. She's royal. Yeah, so royal. We need to hear from Professor Cooper now. Let's give her a big round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2022 honorable guest speaker, Professor Carolyn Cooper. Thanks for that generous introduction. And it's such a pleasure to give this lecture in honor of the right excellent Marcus Garvey. No thanks to Ruth's Foundation for having me. So why won't we listen to Marcus Garvey? Marcus Garvey made a famous prophecy in his 1937 speech delivered in Nova Scotia, Canada. Quote, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, None but ourselves can free the mind. Mind is your only ruler, sovereign. The man who is not able to develop and use his mind is bound to be the slave of the other man who uses his mind, unquote. I forgive Garvey for that generic man. I know he means woman as well. Garvey's prophecy was turned into a command by Bob Marley in his anthemic redemption song, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. Who are the we that Garvey was addressing and the yourselves that Marley sang to? Unfortunately, it's a whole heap of mentally enslaved black people who are not listening to either Garvey or Marley. They are still allowing others to define who they are. They're not developing and using their mind to emancipate themselves from mental slavery. They have disregarded both Garvey's prophecy and Marley's command. Some of us do listen to Marcus Garvey. In particular, Rastafari have long heeded the words of the great Pan-Africanist. And reggae singers and dancehall DJs acknowledge Garvey as an icon of resistance against imperialist ideologies. Burning Spare relentlessly warns us to remember the teachings of Garvey. In old Marcus Garvey, from the 1975 Marcus Garvey album, Burning Spare laments the collective amnesia that diminishes Garvey's heroic stature. Using the literary device of hyperbole, exaggeration for effect, Burning Spirit declares, quote, no one remember old Marcus Garvey, unquote. Almost five decades ago, when the album was released, Burning Spirit understood that even though Garvey had been declared a national hero in 1969, his legacy could be forgotten. Burning Spirit's overstatement of the case asserts the urgent obligation to talk about Garvey inscribing his memory and meaning in the oral tradition, and I would add, in the school system. No one remember old Marcus Garvey. Children, 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 humble yourself and become. One day, somehow, you will remember him. You will. In the very act of speaking Garvey into the consciousness of children, Burning Spear affirms that they will become. The verb become used here without an object suggests a process of becoming, the repossession of the self. 
This is what remembering Marcus Garvey will accomplish. His legacy ultimately is affirmation of the power of self-validation. Burning Spear repetitively asserts, quote, Garvey's old yet young, unquote, suggesting both the longevity and currency of Garvey's message. Seven years later, Steel Pulse released their classic tribute to Garvey, Worth His Weight in Gold. That song inspires us to rally around the flag, rally around the red, gold, black, and green. Garvey's Pan-African flag was, of course, red, black, and green. Steel Pulse's composite flag includes the gold of the Ethiopian flag that has been appropriated by Rastafari. The symbolism of this joint flag underscores the powerful impact of Garveyism on Rastafari. The call to rally around the flag is an affirmation of a global African identity that transcends geographical boundaries. Steel Pulse's emotive flag symbolizes the mass movement of Africans on the continent and in the diaspora who found in Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League a rallying point to assert collective political power. For Marcus Garvey, the Pan-African flag he designed was a vivid symbol of race pride. In 1927, the Negro World newspaper published a quote from a speech made by Garvey in 1921. Quote, show me the race or the nation without a flag, and I will show you a race of people without any pride. Aye, in song and mimicry they have said, every race has a flag but the coon. How true. Aye, but that was said of us four years ago. They can't say it now, unquote. Garvey was referring to the song composed by the white American racists Will A. Healan and J. Fred Health. It was published in 1900 and became a huge hit in both the US and the UK. The United States Library of Congress catalogs the song under the headings Minstrel Music, Popular Songs of the Day, and Songs and Music. The authors of the song use the flag as a symbol of political power that the coon could never achieve. The online etymology dictionary gives an illuminating account of the word coon, quote, the now insulting US meaning black person was in use by 1837, said to be from Barracoon by 1837, from Portuguese Baraca, slave depot, pen or rough enclosure for black slaves in transit in West Africa, Brazil, Cuba. If so, no doubt this was boosted by the enormously popular blackface minstrel act Zip Coon, George Washington Dixon, which debuted in New York City in 1835. But it is perhaps older, one of the lead characters in the 1767 colonial comic opera, The Disappointment, one of the characters is a black man named Raccoon, unquote. In 2021, a century after Garvey affirmed the revolutionary power of his Pan-African flag, notorious dancehall DJ Vibes Cartel posted a perceptive comment on social media. Don't ask me how Cartel is able to maintain a high profile social media presence from prison. That's a whole other story. In his role as teacher, Cartel wrote, quote, knowledge time. Did you know that the first black man in the FBI was tasked with infiltrating Marcus's UNIA movement and destroying it from within? Yep, a boy named James Worley, Wormley Jones. He actually succeeded and Marcus went to prison in America and was then deported, unquote. Cartel underscores the hypocrisy of the Jamaican ruling class about Garvey's legacy. He added, quote, did you know Dutty government sent him to prison in Jamaica? Then after he died, they made him our first national hero, SMFH. Did you know today is a boss's birthday? 
Marcus Garvey liveth forever, unquote. It is true that the Jamaican government is attempting to expunge Garvey's criminal record. He was imprisoned in Jamaica for contempt of court. Furthermore, in February this year, Governor General Sir Patrick Anil Allen declared in his throne speech that, quote, the 60th anniversary of Jamaica's independence and the establishment of diplomatic relations with the United States of America provide a fitting context for advancing the process of clearing the name of the right excellent Marcus Messiah Garvey, Jamaica's first national hero, unquote. Cartel contemptuously describes the ruling elite in Jamaica as dirty government. Despite the belated attempts to exonerate Garvey both in Jamaica and the US, it is clear that successive Jamaican administrations, both the People's National Party and the Jamaica Labour Party, are not actually listening to Marcus Garvey and taking his word seriously. He appears to be an empty symbol. Why is this so? Garvey makes a provocative assertion in philosophy of opinions, which I think provides an answer to that unsettling question. Quote, I never really knew that there was so much color prejudice in Jamaica, my own native home, until I started the work of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. The daily papers wrote me up with big headlines and told of my movement. But nobody wanted to be a Negro. Garvey's crazy, he has lost his head. Is that the use he's going to make of his experience and intelligence? Such were the criticism passed upon me. Men and women as black as I, and even more so, had believed themselves white under the West Indian order of society. I was simply an impossible man to use openly the term Negro. Yet everyone beneath his breath was calling the black man a nigger, unquote. Professor Rupert Lewis has written a brilliant biography of Marcus Garvey in which he comments on that statement, quote, self-denial, denigration, defining one's identity according to colonial Britishness, these were the hallmarks of brown and black West Indians' ambition to escape blackness and what they perceived as Africa's lack of civilization and its savagery, unquote. Garvey launched the UNIA in Jamaica in 1914. What has changed more than a century later? The term Negro is certainly outdated. But if we substitute African for Negro, would Garvey's opinion of the majority of Black Jamaicans be significantly different? One of Garvey's primary missions is summed up in the subtitle of Philosophy and Opinions, or Africa for the Africans. Garvey conceived the Universal Negro Improvement Association as a global movement that would challenge the European conquest of Africa and assert the right to self-government of Black people, both on the continent and in the diaspora. Non-Negro Jamaicans may have rejected the UNIA, but Garvey found a receptive audience for his unifying message of Black power across the globe. Professor Lewis reports that, quote, estimates for membership in and sympathizers of the Garvey movement range from five to 11 million people, unquote, a century ago without social media. Marcus Garvey's philosophy and its application are certainly relevant in Jamaica today. The Ministry of Education must put Garvey on the curriculum at all levels of schooling. Professor Rupert Lewis's accessible biography of Garvey should be required reading for all secondary and tertiary students in Jamaica. The poet and public intellectual Muta Baruka highlights the importance of teaching the youth about Garvey. In his poem, Garvey, he asserts, quote, Garvey action we can duplicate. Black pride him did preach. To the young we must teach. Put Garvey in with reality. Make we check in philosophy. Come children, say it loud. Make them know we're still black and proud." Unquote. Muta Baruka here alludes to James Brown's 1968 Black Power Anthem, Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, which remains a rallying cry for Africans in the diaspora. 
In his 1986 autobiography, James Brown, The Godfather of Soul, the singer affirms, like Muta Baruka, the urgent need to inspire children. Quote, that's why I had children in it. So children who heard it could grow up feeling pride. The song cost me a lot of my crossover audience. The racial makeup at my concerts was mostly black after that. I don't regret it though, even if it was misunderstood. In conclusion then, as we celebrate almost two centuries of emancipation and six decades of flag independence, we must ensure that Garvey's legacy is kept alive. We must claim our identity as a black nation. We are not out of many one people. We are a predominantly African people with a racial minority of Europeans, Chinese, and Indians. African children in Jamaica must be taught to sing along with James Brown, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. It's high time for us to listen to Marcus Darby and put his words into action. A national hero whose words are neither heard nor heeded cannot inspire a society that is still struggling to define its identity. It's up to all of us to ensure that Garvey's prophecy of emancipation from mental slavery is fulfilled in our lifetime. Thank you. I must thank Maria Papiostatu, a brilliant graphic artist from Greece who designed that PowerPoint presentation for me. She's a co-founder with Michael Freestyle Thompson of the International Reggae Poster Contest. Big up, Maria. You are an honorary Jamaican. I think she would appreciate if you just stand like you, like nature, and say, big up yourself, Professor Cooper. So can we say together, I am black and I am proud. I am black and I am proud. Thank you so much, Prof, for that really, really inspiring presentation.